is. But he, you know, he said some of our parishes are really large. And when you say that's true in Florida, yes. right? And I mean, you have magnificent new buildings, facilities, and the parishes can be too big. So the key thing is, how do you really get people to know each other and to have that sense of discipleship? That's very key. You're dealing with new immigrants, you're dealing with snowbirds, you know, you're dealing with all kinds of people, and so you have to be able to uh, bring people together in this way. So he was always talking about forming the parish as a community of many small communities. Right? You've heard that term before? And I, I think it's a great term to be able to use. So what we're saying is adult faith formation is an umbrella, really, that you know, encompasses all these different kinds of groups that we have in the parish, groups or ministries or whatever. So we want to focus, if I was the pastor okay, of a parish, this is the way I would organize it. I'd say, primary thing, adult faith formation. Get the parents to help them learn, uh, teach their kids, you know, all these different kinds of things. But this is where we are. So we're trying to look at how that happens. So in adult faith formation, and this is, I teach a course, as I mentioned at Drew before, just on small Christian community, well, adult spirituality, adult faith formation. But, you know, the whole thing here is, this is how adults learn. All the uh, professors or the theorists on adult learning say adults learn best in small groups when they can share their experience. And we just don't capitalize on this in, in, enough in our parishes. So, you know, it's very important to really think about that. And the best example we have is the RCIA, okay? Unless we have good small groups going on in our parish. So, you know, the principles of faith reflection, you probably know them, right? It's, they're very simple, I'm not going to read them all, but, you know, God is leading us, and we need companions on the journey. That's basically what it says. The only way we're going to be strong is when we have people being strong with us, all right? And someday I'm not strong, someday David is strong, you know? It's, it's that kind of a thing. So, we have all these different things, but again, now if you can understand the concept of trying to uh, have the parish be the school of discipleship. It's so critical that we think about that in every single thing that we do. So if you're going to have a parish fiesta, what part of that is really going to help you form people, etc., etc. <clears throat> there are some essential elements, you know, and Diane mentioned them earlier, but every small group now I'm going to take it a step further, okay? Every meeting in the parish, and indeed, the whole parish should have these elements. And later on, I'll show you how to, a little way of doing an evaluation with them. But you've got to have prayer. Like if I walked into your parish, is this a prayerful parish? Everybody always says yes. Well, why? What makes your parish prayerful? What makes your small group prayerful. All right, somebody said, how do you really help a group be a group, you know, a small group, and not just a social group? Well, prayer is going to be your key thing. The other thing is how people feel welcome or at home. You remember Cheers, where everybody knows my name? The parish has to be a place where everybody knows my name, right? The small group has to be a place where when I need the help or you know, uh, I'm feeling fine, I want to be able to be able to share that with people in a deeper way. And then you have two key pieces here, reflection and learning. You know, one of the things that's not acceptable is just to say, I feel that Jesus is saying such and such to me. That's nice, okay, because we want to have Jesus in our heart. But on the other hand, we want to be able to know what we're talking about. Okay, so the reflection has to be deeper than just what I feel, all right? It's got to be something where there's some learning. So usually I suggest using a material of some sort, okay? And I'll just show you one that I just found. Um, this, uh, we're going to use this in my parish for Lent. It's called Be Merciful, all right? And it's about, um, it's by Bill Hipsch. 
who's got a funny way of spelling his name, H-U-E-B-S-C-H. He's a marvelous writer, okay? But I read this on the plane coming down. I just got a sample copy, and I said, this is one of the most beautiful things he's ever written. Just absolutely beautiful. So this is something that gives you some kind of substance as well as some faith reflection questions and some action. So you want to find a, some kind of a resource that really helps you do both reflection and learning. And then participation. You know, in every parish, we want everybody to be involved in some way or other. And everybody can't be involved at the same level, all right? just for whatever reason. But in our small group, we want to make sure that our small group feels like it's part of that parish life. And again, as Diane stressed this morning, we're going toward mission. What's our mission? So even in your small group, you might ask, what's our mission as a small group? <clears throat> right? Again, that's another workshop we could do another time. But So these are just some interesting things. You see, I have a couple of young adults up there. And uh, when I asked some of the young adults about being in a small group, these are some of the reasons that they join a group. And I don't think they're any different from what most of us join a group for. But a place to find support, this is one I hear all the time. People to speak with about things that matter. You know, it's a place where I can come and do that. I can't do that at work or I can't do it in other places. Trying to listen to others about how God is influencing their lives. Because when we talk about the small group, you know, it, again, it's going back to Dave Verbo, speaking and reading the word of God to each other. So we have to learn to hear how God speaks to us, you know, and, and all the rest of these things. Um, it, it's just, these, these are the hard things that people talk about in terms of their small group. All right, so... What we're really doing, I love big words, right? What we're really doing when we're in a small group is theological reflection. What does that mean? What's theological reflection? It simply means this, right? We're trying to hear and see how God is at work in the world and in my life. Again, uh, hindsight is 2020. Usually I'm pretty good at seeing how God's in my life after I get like a couple of months down the road, you know, when there's something hard you have to deal with. But in fact, that's what small communities are trying to help you do theologically. How is God, uh, and I love this term, okay, how is God a missionary God? <clears throat> how is God a missionary God? We don't think about God as being a missionary, do we? If I say missionary, what do you think of? Africa, okay. Or some foreign place, right? Okay. In fact, the largest missionary territory in, in the world, number one is? Can you guess? It's China. Number two? India. Number three? The United States of America. Okay. So when we talk about God being a missionary God, or us being disciples, being missionary disciples, we're talking about God at work in the world. God comes to us. Okay? So think of God as coming to us, the missionary God. I love that concept. Um, it really helps me a lot. But this is what we're trying to do. Where is God in our life? All right. Questions or comments on that? What are you hearing? They say you have to wait nine seconds. It's already 12. <laughs> we're a slow group. Huh? We're a slow group. You're a slow group. Okay. I thought you said we're a small group. In reference to the last statement, is that what you're asking? In, in reference to just what I've presented here on adult faith formation. Yes. I would like to comment on something that actually touched me. When you baptize somebody and you claim it for Christ, it's not like I baptize you, now go in peace. It's like you belong to my community. Exactly. You belong to us, the community of God. So it's it's so powerful. It just actually 
It's very powerful. It really gave me chills the first, you know, the, again, like the first time I heard it, like with the light bulb went off, because that's it. We're claiming you for the community, and the community is a vast community. Thank you. Yes? When you talked about um, discipleship is apprenticeship, Dennis did a training course a couple of weeks ago, and he said the same thing about apprenticeship, and the whole room went, mm, that's hard. Yes, it is. It's, and it's on-the-job training, you know. So that's why it's so important. When you're doing on-the-job training, that you have some training and some formation. You know, you don't just say, okay, you're a Eucharistic minister, goodbye, good luck, do the job. you got to keep coming back to learn something new. I mean, we, we do that all the time. Somebody over here had a hand. Probably mine. <laughs> I think this is really exciting because it gives us ideas about where we can go to stimulate more interest. And um, for those of us who like have a county mentality, so many small groups do it up, it's very exciting because all of a sudden I realize we have a lot of existing Correct. Groups. Correct. So her comment is you know, when you when you think about it, it's not just starting something new, but when you this is why I'm saying make a list. Who are the ministries? How many people are involved? Who is already meeting in the parish? Look at it all as adult faith formation. I remember there was a great priest in the country who did a lot of work on on evangelization. His name was Father Patrick Brennan. He just died a couple of years ago. And um, he came over and he was talking to a priest that I was working with and myself. And he said to me, I have 700 people in small groups. So my boss turns to me and goes, he's got 700 people in small groups. How come you don't have that many? So I said to him, well, Pat, how do you do that? And he says, because every one of my ministries is a small group. Everything that we already have meeting in the parish is just what's going on here. So that's why in making a plan, okay, we're going to talk more about making a plan. When you're making a plan, you have to take that into consideration because we think we know. But unless we sit down, and we, I'll, I'll tell you a funny story, my last story. This is absolutely true. A priest friend of mine said to me, I'm new in a parish. I need you to come up, because I do consulting work. Come and be, you know, consult with me. Help me form the staff, whatever. Okay, so they, they only had a few people on the staff. A religious ed person, two music ministers, and a secretary, and Frank. Okay? So I said to them, how many ministries do you have in the parish? Dead silence, just like you guys were a minute ago, okay? <laughs> Dead silence. He looked at me like deer in headlights, or I said something in a foreign language, okay, that nobody could interpret. So they looked at me dead serious, dead serious, and said, we don't have any ministries in this parish. I was like this. What? <laughs> so, now, you know how you have to crank up something to say? So I said to them, um, oh... Let's see, do you have mass? Yeah, we have mass. Oh, do you have Eucharistic ministers? Oh yeah, we have Eucharistic ministers. Oh, okay, that's a ministry. Oh. Do you have lectors at mass? Oh yeah, that's a ministry. Oh, uh, you guys are the uh, choir people. Do you have a choir? Of course, we have a great choir. It's a minister. So we went on like that. So finally, they identified in the parish. I made them write it on sticky notes and post it up. Okay? Finally, they identified 36 ministries in that parish. But it was they were clueless because it wasn't written down anywhere. And so that's why I'm saying it's a good thing to do it. And then the next step, okay, would be to organize them under word, worship, community, and service. And then you know what you have in a parish. All right, so you really got to, it's, it's got to be bigger thinking about parish than what we normally do. All right, so I'm hoping that kind of inspires you to take that home and to start putting some of those pieces of the puzzle together. All right? Okay, yes? I think, um, you know, uh, we're new in the parish that we are going to be working now. Um, but uh, sometimes uh, when we talk about small community, we think that we had to go and form, you know, uh, start forming 
a lot of groups. Um, and by doing what you're saying about looking at the parish first and the different the different groups that 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 we have. But by looking at them as a small community, it's an amazing thing. Yes, it is. And I remember one time, um, I don't know if you remember this, but we, we were in a group for many years, five years, um, and, uh, and, and in our church. And we had this couple that was coming for years and years to, the, to, the, to our group. It was not a small Christian community. It was one of the ministry in our church. And when her husband died, when her husband died, we went to uh, to the viewing, and she stood in front and she started to talk about her husband and everything that they went through since they got in the United States. And it was shocking to me that these people were sitting in our um, meetings for years and we didn't know anything mm -hmm. about them. Right. And I felt so horrible because I, you know, um, we wanted to be part of different ministries in our church, but we don't know people that we have in our ministry. So how can we think of forming other groups if we don't even know the ones that we right. have in our ministry. And see, that's why it's so important that however you're organizing ministries or your small groups, you've got to ask those questions. A simple question I always ask when the group comes in, okay, what are you walking in with? What are you dealing with right now? Let's just share that first. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about the sorrow, the upsetment, yes. or whatever it is, the happiness. Just say, what are you walking in with? That's a great icebreaker. You know, and then I always ask as an evaluation question after the group, what are you leaving here with? What what's helped you tonight? Okay? So it yes, that's it's an absolute thing. And we don't know the person sitting in the pew near us. We don't know the person in the ministry. So it's important you you can know them by using this method. But thank you for sharing that. That's such an important piece. So even if we're talking about changing the world, we got to look inside at the first. same time. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't even say first. I say you could do it together. you got to do both. Because when people say, yeah, we have to look in, in our home first or whatever, well, that's good, but then some, after you try to clean up everything, you never get to the outside either. So you have to do both. All right. It looks like... Um, we're coming on toward lunchtime. When you We're just going to do her. Just do Nancy's piece? Okay. All right. So, prepa oh, preparing the soil in the diocese. Nancy is one of the most incredible small Christian community leaders in the country in terms of the diocese. 